And thank you for joining me for another Blunt Business here on CannabisRadio.com. We really appreciate all of you joining us. And as I record this program, I got to get up uh, first thing in the morning and go head down to the Benzinga Cannabis Capital Conference. And obviously, this is going to be recorded after the fact, but it, I will get a chance to go and talk to quite a few guests that we've had on the program. And overly looking forward to go ahead and getting some good information off of that event. One of the first events I've gone out on the road in a long time for myself. And we'll most likely start recruiting a few guests that we'll have to talk about what happens after Benzing and also after the fact of where the state of Florida is right now, where adult use is now going to be on the ballot in November with Amendment 3. We've already talked about that for an interview to have upcoming for the program where I spoke with Matthew Ginder, who is with the group of Green Spoon Martyr. We talked about that, specifically his work in the Florida market and talking about that specifically. So look forward to that interview. If you haven't listened to it yet, it's already available now. CannabisRadio.com, Cannabis Radio app. And of course, you can find the show wherever you find podcasts. My next guest has launched business ventures across five continents, has listed companies on the New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, and the London Stock Exchange, and has exited several businesses via sales to Fortune 50 companies. He has also led or partnered investments across sectors as diverse as financial services, consumer goods, social media, technology, and natural resources, and has guided several of his portfolio companies to successful IPOs, which I'm sure many of the cannabis industry would like to go ahead and keep an eye on because, you know what, to get to that publicly traded level and try to get that extra level of revenue, we're sure we're going to get a lot of that information from my guest, the co-founder of NanCan Companies and the chairman and founder of Corestone Capital. I'm here with Will McDonough. Will, thanks for being with us. Yeah, nice to see you. Thanks again. And my pleasure. So your financial industry experience, I didn't get into the whole thing, but again, in your background, it's extensive. I can only summarize it by saying this. So you have your financial industry experience has included the investment management division of Goldman Sachs. You're well among royalty here in finance here with you, where you manage more than $17 billion in private capital for their current and retired partners. You also worked at Avenue Capital Group, where you co-founded a $250 million distressed debt fund of funds, and also Atlas Mare, which is also a publicly traded, a banking group serving sub-Saharan Africa. And you co-founded with former Barclay CEO Bob Diamond. My, that's that's just scratching the surface, Will, obviously, for what you've done in your career. So I'm always fascinated by who decides to go and enter into the industry or decides to invest in the industry. So... You recently have, in the last couple of years, you've made portfolio entries into cannabis. What was your onus? What was your modus operandi by, behind doing that? Well, I'm always, uh, you referenced a few of them, but I'm always tracking emerging industries, no matter what sector they're in. Cannabis uh, has been interesting to me, you know, once it started to become legalized gradually. Uh, as you know better than I, there was such a big pop in the early days of public companies and capital vehicles acquiring uh, assets, you know, maybe for more richly than they should have in a, in a bit of consolidation, which um, people felt like was a bit of the gold rush. And some of that's flushed out, which I think is healthy for the industry. But um, I, I did not participate in that wave per se, but I certainly was involved with, you know, the early um, formation of a uh, dispensary one of two licensed dispensaries on the island of Nantucket, um, which, you know, w is interestingly an island off the coast of Massachusetts. But because it's an island, it's surrounded by federal water. And so um, any cannabis that's consumed legally on Nantucket or on any island mm -hmm. needs to be grown, manufactured, packaged, and, uh, and, com and, and compliance tested on that same island. And so, you know, when, when you think about uh, investment opportunities, sometimes you'll hear the term a moat. Well, uh, an island 25 miles at sea uh, with a moat that makes it actually federally illegal to transport product uh, on or off, you know, was, was an interesting dynamic that I thought should be explored. So I participated in helping to fund that and, and, and form that business. And, and that's one of, you know, two operating businesses on the island today that does well, but it also, because of how hard that was to do and because, you know, we, for lack of a better term, um, had to figure out how to do all the compliance testing onshore. We couldn't drop it at a, 
envelope and send it to a third party. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we had to do all that stuff under the same roof. And so we're growing it in the basement, we're packaging it in the attic and, and selling it on the ground floor. Um, with that, you know, really forced us to learn how the business worked. And so in uh, exploring that as kind of my first foray in, you know, um, and having watched what happened to craft brewers uh, over the last decade be acquired by the big players like Anheuser Busch, mm-hmm. just made perfect sense for me that kind of the next leg of that stool was going to be, you know, cannabis companies that are going to be creating institutional quality products in, in, in a regulated and compliant manner. Uh, and building them such that as it becomes more and more legal and more and more commonplace, the big dogs who won't play in that currently at some point are going to come knocking and they're going to want to only, you know, play ball with the folks that uh, have done things, you know, the right way since inception and don't come with any uh, skeletons in the closet. Now, I want to unpack a few things with there, Will. A few things with that because of the, the types of people we've had that have come in in management from other Fortune 5000 companies or the types of investors that came in might have put some kind of an initial investment, might not have seen the return they wanted from it. And then also, who decided to go make those investments? Because I go back to an interview I did a while back with Brianna, Brianna Neff, who is a chief food scientist and founder of Berlixi. And I remember for her work, you know, we were talking about the fact that, you know, in 2018, when you think about CBD products, and you think about the different products that were being done and which company decided to go ahead and jump in that came in and came out. Molson Coors, right? They tried to do CBD infused drinks, Constellation Brands, the makers of Modelo, Ben and Jerry's tried to look into all this. And then, and Starbucks, I remember even Pepsi, I think was even a part. And all these companies kind of just cooled back. And the initial thought about putting into it, so what was it? Molson Coors, they ended the joint venture. Constellation had written down more than a billion dollars on cannabis investments and other companies show of plans for CBD products or anything cannabis related, decided to just go in and just not be a part. And then there's quite a few investors I know that, you know, when I think of the interview we did with Steve D'Angelo over on our Green Peak series, you know, he always talks about the people in Silicon Valley are always keeping an eye on what's going on with cannabis, but it's all fence setting. And I just want to get from your take, Will, because from your financial background, what is the kind of thought process about coming into this space, obviously you had a curiosity of what you decided to go and do. And we're going to talk about, you know, working in Nantucket and working with the brand that you have now, uh, the, the portfolio of companies you're working on right now, we're going to talk about that in the next segment, but just your thought process about what other investors are thinking about cannabis. And, you know, instead of doing that normal kind of thought process of where an industry is starting to go ahead and come in, obviously emerging industry, your interest is emerging industries as well, but others Cannabis hasn't been thought so much where they decided, well, let's go and take the big risk. Let's put the money in. Or some of them did and they took it away. Yeah. I think, you know, everyone got a little bit excited at first and, and, um, that recoil has been natural, but well, I'll tell you about the big brands and the big companies and the big capital coming into the space. They beg for regulatory certainty. They beg for compliance clarity. They can't operate in the gray. You know, if you have a business that makes a billion dollars a year making Pepsi, you can't go, you know, jumping into the pool and um, and and uh, trying to get into, you know, cannabis, which is state by state, not federal, CBD, um, you know, which, although it's farm bill legal, doesn't necessarily have the regulatory guidance that, you know, Fortune 100 companies would be I- I- expecting for packaging and for, you know, um, insurance and, and disclosures and that that's still immature. And so what you have is people that are willing to kind of go out on the, on that curve a little bit and take a little bit more risk and navigate that, uh, the emergence of compliance and the emergence of a regulatory regime that, that, you know, once that is in place, that's when those big dogs are going to come in heavy. And those big dogs were going to come in heavy and want to transact with the companies that have been built, you know, in a compliant manner and fit that mold. And so what I tell people, whether it's cannabis or blockchain or 
any of the emerging industries that I pay attention to and, and spend time in is not a the biggest misconception is that those operating in it are trying to do harm or are trying to skirt regulation or are trying to do illegal activity. In reality, my experience has been that they're begging to be compliant. They just need guidance on what compliance means. And so, you know, if you and I are starting a business and we're guessing on what's right to do, well, we're going to get some things wrong. And, you know, the regulators are trying to figure it out slower than we are because they don't, don't understand the space as well as those that are deep in it. But, but part I, of it is now the speculation that there could be where there are regulations, there are levers of control in place in other industries. I mean, you could say with when it comes to Bitcoin, I, I feel like there is something where we're starting to see that precious metals or Bitcoin, and we're seeing how everything kind of worked out in terms of the the bear market that we're dealing with right now in the stock market and just in general in finance that everything went down even with during whatever it might have been whatever there is there's there was kind of like a thought process where there's a, there was a point that bitcoin everybody thought was going to be able to surpass any issues that precious metals or other you know currencies would have but yet it took a dive anyway for whatever reason is back up again not really understanding what what that is but at the higher level obviously there's more investment with cannabis, it's all reliant upon government intervention because the state-by-state -state process we have now, there's too much of compliance to go into play that we really can't, can't really, it's too, there's just too much informality so far. Really don't know where to go with things at the moment. And so right now we're waiting to go and see, well, whatever speculation there might be that will cause a spur in investment for some of these ETS or some of these other stocks, I'm not sure what it is that causes that because to me, I've said on this program many times, three to five years we're looking at any chance of any kind of government oversight or government intervention where they're going to go ahead and regulate and they're going to make all states fall the same suit. Because until there's a supermajority in the House and the Senate, and that doesn't matter which side it's going to be on, I think cannabis will get passed no matter what, whichever you know side of the aisle that they are, doesn't make a difference. But until then, until there's a supermajority that can actually pass bills, including cannabis, I've tried to figure out what the speculation that these investors are seeing that I don't see, that the regular layman person can't see. What is it that they're not, that, that we can't see as, you know, kind of amateur investors, that there's always some speculation that will fuel without that government oversight that will still make people go ahead and buy in? Well, it's because people are willing to take the risk that that government oversight is going to be clarified and solidified. And so they can buy something today that's discounted um, because of the fact that when the regulatory uh, clarity comes, that is going to be taken away. And therefore, the biggest barrier to a lot of that big capital coming into the space is going to go away. And so that will avail, you know, the entire market of new dollars like we've seen with Bitcoin. You know, when Bitcoin got the ETF approved a few months ago, nothing changed about the mechanism of Bitcoin. The only thing that changed was that the demographic of people that could now legally buy and hold Bitcoin went up exponentially. And so you had something that was fixed, limited supply. And, and massive new influx of demand, of course the price is going to go up when that happens. Now, right now in the cannabis industry, you have, you know, different levels of clarity depending on the state that you're in, but in the inability because of the state-by-state -state, um, uh, requirements for big multinational companies to own the most prominent businesses in the space. When that regulatory clarity comes... All of a sudden, that barrier goes away, and all of a sudden, those new dollars are going to be coming in. And those are dollars that were previously unable to come into the space. Now, what's going to happen is it's going to create some separation between the haves and the have-nots, if you will, and those that have been well capitalized, have operated, you know, above the bar, and and, and have been running a good, solid business with a good brand. 
are going to have some interesting conversations like weeks after that government approval changes. Now, that doesn't mean that it's all going to be, you know, solved. They're going to have to put in place, you know, they're going to have to give it oversight from the FDA or from the DEA or, you know, they're going to have to give some some oversight of the industry, just like they have the alcohol industry, have some compliance procedures and reporting requirements, and that's all welcomed and appropriate. But that's just not going to happen just because the vote comes in, you know, 5149. That's going to happen you know, in the, in the quarters after, you know, whenever that vote does happen, which I agree with you, you know, should come regardless of which party is, is in office. Until this point, and that's just pure speculation. This is just me kind of coming off the, the top. I always wondered why, when you look at, you know, possible commodities, obviously I want to go and bring up the fact that, you know, I'll ask to bring this point up that you speak to a lot of media, you know, I've seen you on CBC and other spots, but I think I've seen you on and regularly dis- discuss your speculations on the green energy metals, the EV market, and Bitcoin. And one of those areas I just want to ask before I get to that point is why cannabis has never been looked at as an agricultural commodity, like a wheat or an orange juice or a- anything like that. I mean, would that be something that would interest you if it was put up on the Chicago Commodities Exchange, if that was something that was a possibility? You know, I never thought about that, but that is interesting. Um, you know, what those markets trade at, they call them the futures markets. Right. So in essence, you know, what you're able to do is say, what are you willing to pay me for a barrel of oil in October versus November? Right. Not what would you pay me for today, but what are you going to pay me for out on that curve? And so, you know, the cannabis industry or, or you know, cannabis could also trade in that manner, although it would require way more transparency and understanding of the true volume of supply in the market and a way to, you know, uh, qualify that. The orange juice market, as an example, trades based on uh, growth seasons and was the weather in Florida good? And, you know, it's because the traders have transparency into the true volume that should be coming onto the market and who those buyers are and what they might be willing to pay for it. As we all know, you know, the cannabis industry still has tremendous amounts of volume that is outside the purview of any regulator, which would uh, make it hard. But but once that goes away and once that becomes regulated and and transparent, you know, I think you could see uh, an opportunity like that. And I think that's a smart thought. Well, I think about that as well, because I remember when we talked to the folks at LeafLink and Ben Burstein, I should supposed to meet him over in Benzinga coming up when we go and do that tomorrow. But okay, for instance, 420 obviously is coming up right now as we're recording this. We're just a couple of days short of that, but that's obviously one date. And I believe we talked about it in their holiday sales guide that in their information, they noticed how there was, first of all, the sales of cannabis would, would go up into 420. And the reason why is because there's so much surplus that's been built up during the holiday season, that November, December, whatever they can't sell, and there's a particular expiration date or a perishing date that they need to be able to sell all this ex- existing inventory by. So they might be buying three or four months old product that was already cultivated and they need to get it off the shelves. So obviously there will be a hike in prices in 420, probably another significant hike in prices in 710, and then in the holiday season. So you would at least know three significant times where that commodity could definitely change. Plus you could also depend on you know, what states are opening up in the market. And, you know, we know Minnesota and Ohio is already opening up. You can see where that goes as well. And maybe there's just something where, you know, what particular cannabis could be put up and what the pricing could be. And also have that be a way to kind of set and regulate the prices for the entire country if there was something like that. The real function of that, which could serve the industry, is that the people that are playing in the early days of those futures markets are usually the producers themselves mm-hmm. because somebody can say, I will, I will sell you a contract. That means I have to deliver you a pound um, of flour on October 15th of 2024. And you will pay me today to deliver it to you tomorrow. Right. Right. And so that uh, you'll pay me less than you would have had to have paid me the day of because I'll take a discount based on the fact that I'm getting the money now. 
But in reality, I use that futures market as a way to finance my current operation. So I say, okay, I'll give you a, a forward contract or a futures contract on this pound. You give me the cash now. I use the cash to fund my operation between now and then and grow enough to you know, fill that contract. But oh, by the way, I'm also going to be able to grow, uh, you know, more and, and, and have it on hand, you know, when that day comes. So get back to my original point about what you look at at speculating when it comes to other markets that could be considered a bit of a fringes in the same way. What about your approach to emerging markets and how you take the jump to invest yourself or get involved in a company? So before you decided to go ahead and make the jump into cannabis, what was it that you needed to go ahead and research before you decided to make that jump? Really, when the states started getting momentum uh, and and more and more um, states started approving it, it just started to become clear that this was here to stay. You know, the momentum is there, and even at the federal level, where it's it's inevitable that that's going to get approved. And so, you know, similar like I said about Bitcoin and blockchain, and I've been involved in that industry for six years now. Uh, with the same thing is, you know, if you believe regulations coming. And if you believe regulation opens the doors to new demand that wasn't there previously, um, and you believe in the medicinal benefits of the plant versus the, you know, technical benefits of the blockchain, um, that's a pretty good setup, right? Because I'm just willing to wait. I'm willing to buy now and, and hold and wait until the regulation and the clarity comes. Those new entrants come, and I'm happy to be having been there waiting for them. What's interesting, too, is that in cannabis only about five years ago, I remember we had a lot of things where Bitcoin obviously was beginning such getting what was getting to be so viral when it comes down to just talking about it and thinking of what companies are trying to create new coins and trying to create NFTs. And it wasn't that long ago we started hearing all about this, and that all kind of went by the wayside. And now we're at the point where you know, there have been companies that have either or incorporated blockchain into their process when it comes to either like for finances to be able to go ahead and, you know, convert cash that they bring in into blockchain and then convert it back out. We've seen companies like that or trying to use Bitcoin as a possible avenue of, you know, currency so they can go and control and be able to go ahead and use that for sales of cannabis, but really never saw much more of that. But do you feel like with Bitcoin... Just is there something where can this be brought in together? I mean, do you think there was there's a reason why Bitcoin in general for an industry like cannabis did not work out for them? Well, I think you know when when I look at investments like cannabis or Bitcoin or whatever it might be, one of the rules that I try to follow is, and I think this is appropriate more broadly, but make the hard part the only part that you're working with right so like if, if there's there's already the obstacles to getting people comfortable with cannabis and buying it in the in the manner that it's you know being sold in in dispensaries and swiping your id and whatever there's already people that are you know have, have nerves about that and and the masses are not engaging with that don't also add on to it the complexity of uh you know bitcoin and blockchain and volatile digital assets like that um similarly you know if i was going to build a blockchain protocol i would build it about the most vanilla thing possible so that when i'm invite meeting with investors the only obstacle i have to getting them comfortable with what i'm doing is the the actual attribute of whatever it is i'm doing you know don't don't combine things and because that's one plus one equals three of complexity. Uh, and so I think when you, you know, even though digital assets and, you know, uh, utilizing digital assets and Bitcoin and, and, and stable coins for transactions is no doubt the smartest and safest way uh, for, you know, uh, dispensaries to transact. It's just still too early for both things. And I think commingling them only makes both of them harder to accomplish. Let's go to commercial break. When we come back, I want to go and get into the actual cannabis investments you've already made. So we're going to talk about the 
company, Nan Can Companies. The new product has been pushed out, Nantucket Longbird Drinks. We'll talk about that and go into the whole idea where it's all about that. So we're going to go back, come back real quick. I'm here again with the co-founder of Nan Can Companies, the chairman and founder of Core Stone Capital. Will McDonough here on Blood Business. We'll be back with more questions after this. And welcome back to Bone Business. I'm here with Will McDonough, the founder, co-founder of Nan Ken Companies, chairman and co-founder of Core Stone Capital. And we were mentioning new products that you have now as a co-founder again. You and your team have recently been embedded into adult beverages with, first of all, FX Bat Brewing, Brewing Company, and you had the launch of Friday Beers. And now Nan Ken Companies, which is developing cutting-edge hemp and CBD-focused consumer products. You recently launched Nantucket Longbird Drinks. And for those who want to take a look at the Drinks, go ahead and look for the website longbird.buzz, longbird.buzz, and you can go ahead and find the hemp-infused seltzers and look there for yourself and see what the products are. Might you buy yourself a six-pack or whatever there might be. So you have made these drinks with a blend of fresh fruit, premium quality hemp, and spring water for those that enjoy a robust range, robust range of hard seltzer products that have emerged worldwide. So take me to the idea of you know, one thing to do the investments, but also now to go into companies and creating products. As you said earlier, when we got into this, you were talking about Nantucket Island, about what you had to go to be able to do to go ahead and build a service the area where you can take it outside of outside of waters because of the fact there's federal waters. So what you're able to go and do, talk about these drinks, the setup for this and what came, how this came about. Sure. Yeah. So we have a dispensary called Act Natural that we're a minority partner in, but you know, are on the advisory board of, and have really helped uh, build that business and, and get that thing off the ground. Within the walls of Act Natural, we have uh, built a bottling facility uh, that just makes THC infused drinks, which is called Nantucket Cannabis Cocktails. Those are exclusively sold in our dispensary on island. We aspire to sell those more broadly, you know, as that industry takes shape. We really use that as kind of an R&D test kitchen for us to mess with different um, flavor profiles and, you know, like you say, all natural fruits and really try to take lessons learned from our team from the RTD alcohol industry and apply it to, you know, the seltzer industry that we see as rising. And, and part of why we got really excited about the Nantucket Longbird, um, and uh, and the ability to do you know CBD infused or hemp infused seltzers as we call them is because as you know you know uh, cannabis consumption uh, CBD Delta Nine whatever you know derivation you're engaging with is not necessarily always a very social uh, thing. Uh, it might be you know sitting around with some friends and relaxing. You're going to the beach, you know, which which of course we all understand, but. Part of what people love about alcohol is that it's consumed in a social environment and you can go to a bar and meet someone for a drink. You can take a six pack to the beach. You know, your uh, engagement with alcohol is usually way more social than your engagement with cannabinoids. And so can we develop a line of seltzers that tastes as good, good as a high noon, you know, or an Nantucket craft cocktail as, as we are, um, you know, more familiar with and um you know 30 calories five milligrams of cbd and know a that the dosing is going to be dead on so i know what drinking two of them or three of them feels like versus five or six of them and i can consume them based upon that uh like we easily say it's the equivalent you know drinking a can is the equivalent of, of eating a, a five milligram gummy um and um, you you know you can calibrate the onset of that and, and how much of that you want to consume uh, on a night, but because it's now in a drinkable form and in a kind of slower uh, consumption, right? You're gonna not smoke for ten minutes and be done. You're gonna drink a six pack over the course of an hour and a half, and you know extend the time and extend the uh, engagement and and really make it more of a social opportunity. And so is there a future where people don't seek alcohol, but still seek some social engagement and the ability to kind of blend those two things together and give people high quality product? I think, you know, I can see a future where you're going to a cannabis cafe 
or going to even a bar and restaurant and just deciding to order, you know, a hemp beverage instead of an alcohol beverage because you like the way it makes you feel or the way the way you feel the day after. And um, um, you know, if that is a reality in our future, you know, we want to be someone that's making a very high quality, you know, low calorie, high taste beverage that uh, is also packaged and you know distributed in a way where when Anheuser Busch wants to have a, a, a hemp line, well, we want to be acquirable by them. And so we're measuring three times and, and cutting once, as they say, and making sure that every little decision we make is not cutting corners, is not moving too fast, and is not running afoul of any regulation. Because we want to embrace that and we want to be, you know, uh, by the book so that when the big dogs come to play, you know, we're somebody that they can can transact with. Yeah. And I've noticed there's quite a few different companies that are putting out adult beverages in the cannabis space in Massachusetts particularly. Quite a few that we've actually talked to on the program too here in our grassroots marketing series. And so you made mention of with Nantucket Longbird Drinks, Five milligrams each of THC and CBD. You have it in Tangerine Dream and Alcapoco Gold. And coming up also in Blackberry Bramble, coming up soon. So very strong, very exotic flavor palettes to go with this. And, you know, in a very competitive Massachusetts cannabis market. So coming into this space and deciding to go and come in with a launch here, you know, talking about the, the road ahead and how that looks and where you can see Nantucket Longbird going, you know, if it goes outside of Massachusetts. You know, you, you mentioned some of the previous businesses that I've been lucky to be involved in. And, um, I was a seed investor in a company called Zico Coconut Water and Zico Coconut Water ended up being acquired by Coca-Cola. Right. Yeah. What happened there was, and I remember it vividly, people saying, oh, well, you know, Zico is good, but aren't you worried about Vita Coco? And our answer was always, no, because it's just raising awareness for the sector, right? And as long as you make a high quality drink um, and, and, it, and it's got a specific silo that it sits in, you actually want competition because you want other people innovating. You want other people investing in educating the market. You want people exposed to it. And then you just want to do your best job to, to deliver the best product. And so if you deliver a great product in a expanding marketplace, you're going to, you're going to see success. And so we don't view ourselves as really having competition. We, we, uh, view ourselves as having other people that are on the same curve as us and, and driving adoption and awareness. And, and, um, so we're rooting for everybody. It's amazing. I love the idea of the products, but it's one thing also to be said about for, I guess, for whatever reason, Massachusetts, it's just a popular spot for beverages. Obviously we know that by Sam Adams and other companies like that in the mainstream space, but with cannabis here and the seltzer space and how much it's changed rapidly that, you know, this is really where, you know, what crafted kind of green sh drinks are out there that you're going to come up with. And then all of a sudden, here we go, you know, a product like yours can come right back in here. And it's like you said, I love the fact you, the way you approach the competition and the fact that, you know, the idea that you might, considered to be acquirable by the time that the bigger companies decide to go and come on in and say, you know what, we want to get in the market. Corporate says, we're not going to make it ourselves. We're not going to do it. What, what, do a blueprint on a new product? No, we could buy somebody. And so they can go and look at what you're doing with your tracker and say, you know what, Will, let's, uh, let's talk. <laughs> yeah, I get to definitely see that happening. The R&D and the innovation is no joke either. You know, in, in the right. also the, you know, the cannab cannabinoid oils uh, so that it doesn't taste like a tincture, um, you know, the blending of these things with real fruit so that you're getting a good taste, but you're not getting, you know, a uh, manufactured kind of palate. We're really spending a lot of time and money making sure that all those things are done right because when those guys want to engage and they, and they want to have a product on their own shelves, they don't want to wait two, three years to learn all that on their own. You know, like they say, you know, learn by shaving on someone else's face. Um, we're making those mistakes now. We're making those investments now and in innovating and, and growing. And, and by the time, um, you know, these products are available nationwide, uh, they're going to be dang good. And, and there's, and people are going to be really coming back for seconds. 
And I know you obviously thought about the flavor profile because of the very exotic, very, uh, kind of very sour, tangy kind of flavors that you picked when it comes to Ac- Acapulco Gold. And the way it's spelled is different also as well. A C K A P U L C O. Tan- pineapple and orange in that particular flavor. Then Tangerine Dream and then Blackberry Bramble, which is blackberry flavor, obviously, and they're very strong kind of flavors of that. So obviously you did that, that research development. Just the, just by the flavor palette tells me that you put a lot of work in, your team put a lot of work into getting this all put, there, put together and taken care of. So again, the website, longbird.buzz, if you want to go take a look at that. We'll talk more about that and let people know where they can go also find it in stores. But coming up, we want to go to one more break. And when we come back, I want to ask Will about the stock market in terms of cannabis stocks because they're, they're the real state of the cannabis market when it comes to publicly traded stocks. We'll talk about that with Will McDonough, co founder of Nankin Companies, chairman and co founder of Core Stone Capital here on Blunt Business with final questions with Will after this. And we're in the home stretch here on Blunt Business. I'm here with Will McDonough, co founder of Nankin Companies, chairman and co founder of Core Stone Capital. And Will, really appreciate you talking to me and really giving me the whole setup of where we are, things right now, in terms of uh, you know what you've done in investments, what you've done in your own companies to get into the space and making some significant changes here. So I want to go ahead and now jump into I want to go ahead and jump into the stock market with you because there's a lot that's going on with that. I want to take from Green Market Report; they reported this recently. Cannabis stocks are notoriously volatile. But it looks like it, as if they might be finally rewarded for good performance. Some big name MSOs, multi stat operators, are clocking solid results in the latest earnings cycle, and valuations have responded. And they went on to write that investors are paying higher prices as they begin to buy and trade. Trading volumes are have risen in the last two weeks as I record this program. Schedule three rumors are continuing to be unabated online. More people believe it might really happen. How and actually, uh, the White House press secretary actually talked about that, you know, the HHS and and other agencies have already finalized a report. Now we're just waiting for the final answer, but that's imminently going to happen. I believe that's going to happen before the election is done and we're going to be in for it. And obviously that, as I've talked about with other guests other on Blunt Business, that that's an extra, what, you know, 10 to 12% of revenue that can be written off in taxes that can come back to companies and then companies like Ascend Wellness Holdings, well, they're going to test the opportunities and say, all right, well, let's go and try to get our last three years of taxes written off and try to get that money back, which could be accumulating up to what, $10 million if they can get it done. So they're saying here that the biggest rewards are going to the winners while participants will only see a mild buzz in valuations. So Cannabis ETS and stocks now, either whether it's Toronto or whether it's here in the States and where they're being traded, you know, for the right now, I mean, what's the question you always get asked? Are you bullish about right now the cannabis market in terms of where, you know, what kind of a play there is to be made right now to buy or sell or to hold? Yeah, I think that there is a lot of value in the public cannabis stocks just because they've been so annihilated and, um, you know, over the course of the past couple of years, they're down from so so dramatically from where they were at one point that there's got to be value in there. I will say that after looking at that as an investment opportunity, I, I have been told by people in the industry that, you know, spend 24 hours, seven days a week building and, and, and grinding um, that it might make sense in the long term to, you know, kind of just buy some of these public companies that have rolled up multi-state operations and participate in, in their their benefit from, you know, regulatory change. And um, so I wouldn't be adverse at all to having a portfolio of the publicly traded cannabis stocks, whether they be here or Toronto. I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't want to give you a specific name right now because I haven't done the full extent of the work, although I do know that there's probably good value there that, you know, is worth exploring. Markets Insider actually put a story about this, and they talk about now that in the last year, the majority of the 14 major cannabis companies have seen their market value increase compared to their expected earnings. That's according to an overall increase in the enterprise value to consensus next 12-month EBITDA multiples for the majority of the 14 major MSOs they analyzed. And 11 of those 14 have seen valuations 
multiples rise with increases ranging from 3% to up to 70%. And, you know, I mean, we can see whatever companies are able to go and generate and say, okay, here's their quarterly report. And, you know, we got revenues up again. We're continuing to rise. But, you know, there's still volatility nevertheless. And, you know, what would be the what would be the catalyst that would probably make if if something that would I guess what would be the, the announcement or something that would go ahead and tell investors okay we can seriously start investing in cannabis like what would have to happen in terms of what the federal government has to do or any kind of an announcement you feel like would be the start of things to come that would have to happen before anybody could really take a full attention and say okay we need to really go ahead and put some significant money into it, like the Warren Buffets of the world might even have to go and take a look. Yeah, I don't think we're too far away from that, especially if the current, the coming election cycle um, really incorporates any of these messages into their uh, campaigning. Um, and if it becomes clear to the market that both parties are aligned and that, you know, it probably makes sense to generate tax revenue from this and create federal oversight of it, uh, I think that that would be welcomed. And I think that that could kick off a whole new bull run and people getting excited about the cannabis companies that have already accumulated, you know, valuable assets across the country, um, as well as, you know, the privately held entities that might have a new, um, you know, banking and M&A activity in the sector, you know, to, to create potential uh, exits for themselves. And so that could be sooner than, you know, you think. Uh, it depends on how the, t the two campaigns treat that, you know, rolling into the election in November. Well, I really appreciate you taking time out to talk to us all about this. Uh, like I said, I'm more than happy to talk to you about when it comes to what you're doing right now with Nantucket companies with the Nantucket Longbird series of, of beverages now that you have in play and so much more. Obviously, there's a bunch of websites we could go ahead and talk about at the moment. When it comes to Core Stone Capital, of course, corestonecapital.com, C-O-R-E, stonecapital.com. We talked about longbird.buzz. If you want to go and take a look for the drinks, it's all available there. And if you can't, just take a minute to go and talk more about, you know, what you've planned in terms of what you're looking at with the cannabis investments and where Nancan Companies goes from here, just following along with what you're going to do with Longbird. Anything else you can tell us that you look like that you might be looking to do concerning, uh, you know, further growth of what you're doing in this space. Yeah. Um, we are really excited. Uh, Nan N Nantucket Longbird is now available, um, in about 150 liquor stores across Massachusetts and that's rising, um, daily. We launched, uh, I believe our first case sale was in November or December and we're already the number four highest selling beverage in the state. So something's working there, and we're proud of that. We are launching a, a new section of longbird.buzz imminently, hopefully within the next week, uh, that will allow you to buy four packs of the product um, on the website and have that uh, shipped directly to your door across 50 U.S. states. So we're really trying to take a lot of the guesswork out of this thing and make it easy for people to try it. Uh, and we think that once people try it, you know, we're going to be the solution that they, uh, that they keep coming back to. Fantastic. Again, Will McDonough is co-founder of Nankin Companies, chairman and co-founder of Core Stone Capital. Thank you so much for being all of us. Really appreciate you taking time out. Yeah. Nice to spend time with you. Thank you. Thank you listeners as well. Appreciate you always taking time to get and listen to us here on Blood Business. And we'll talk to you next time.